Hey, Mark here, and we're continuing in our series on um, residual energy and haunts. Tonight's segment has to do deal with um, how paranormal investigators distinguish between um, residual energy haunts and uh, intelligent haunts. And we're going to show how that is really an insuperable problem, which calls, which shows why this is a notion that um, has deep flaws to it and needs to be rejected. Um, let's move on. I, I want to continue to show, or attempt to show, that this notion of residual energy is deeply flawed. It is internally inconsistent. It is anti-scientific. And it is very harmful, demonic notion. You know, frankly, it disturbs me that something so significant, expe significant, especially for the homeowner, is decided in such a subjective, quick, capricious, contradictory, non-systematic, and non-uniform fashion. You know, talking about distinguishing between intelligent or non-intelligent haunts. There are no agreed upon guidelines for determining the distinction between intelligent or non-intelligent hauntings. The problem is exacerbated when the same location allegedly has both residual and intelligent activity. So, how does one distinguish between the two? And both intelligent and non-intelligent haunts are said, at least at times, to have exactly the same activity. Exactly the same way of looking, smelling, or sounding. It can make it really difficult to determine. Point number one. Perhaps the most common test to determine the distinction is done via EVP or its equivalent. Um, if there is an intelligent reply, then it's obviously intelligent. But if there seems to be no attempt to reply or to interact in an intelligible fashion, then it's usually automatically assumed to be residual in nature. But the tests are anything but uniform in nature. We'll come back to this in just a moment, but let me just add this quickly. For example, if you do the flashlight test, you know, what, what if the, upon first request, the resident spirits don't comply and with your request to turn on the lights. Do you then assume that they are not intelligent? Point number two. Moving versus stationary cold spots. Uh, many assume that if you have a cold spot that moves, it's intelligent. If it remains static or stationary, it's residual or non-intelligent. May I ask a question? Are, cap are you capable of standing still? <laughs> Does that mean that you're non-intelligent? And seriously, humans or demons both can stand still and still be intelligent. That's a silly test. Okay, number three. For some, phantom footsteps or um, knockings are always considered residual. For others, they're always considered uh, the reverse, intelligent. For others, it's up in the air. Um, for other people, if an event is seen in the same place regularly, then it's considered residual, as if demons cannot create patterns. My question is, what has to happen or not happen in order to make the massively significant and practical decision that the haunt is not intelligent? and thus poses no problem to the client. Is it one EVP that goes unanswered or answered in an odd way? Or two, three, how many? And at what point is it clearly residual? This is a huge problem for investigators, as we're going to see. You know, consider this scenario with paranormal, um, our paranormal investigators, hypothetical. Um, investigator A asks, what do what did you do and then two minutes later the same investigator asks who are you and then five minutes later they get a class a evp that says a c 
energy. And they scratch their heads and say, well, that's obviously residual because it doesn't make a bit of, bit of sense, AC energy. So they assume it's not intelligent, but a week later, their researcher comes along and tells them that Tesla, the inventor, had once lived there for a brief period. See, he's the one who invented AC energy. My point is this. You would have to be omniscient, all-knowing, to rule out all the possibilities that the reply was not intelligent. Given all the variables involved, you know, we're assuming ghost theory is tr true for argument's sake here. You would have to know all, you know, again, you'd have to be all-knowing to make that assumption that the reply was uh, in no way meaningful because you'd have to, again, know all the variables of the history of that house, as that uh, illustration showed. Number four, for argument's sake, again, assume ghosts are real. Maybe the ghosts were irritated and spoke sarcastically. I mean, this is often said to be the case in intelligent haunts, isn't it? You know, just to irritate the investigator. Maybe they are, maybe the ghosts are shy and don't like talking to strangers. You know, there is said to be an alleged continuity of personality after death between the living person and their ghost. So how would you factor in things like shyness, emotional states, panic attacks, or, you know, even mental health issues? That's what I was driving at. Even assuming the truth of non-intelligent haunt, for argument's sake, on their own principles, there are numerous reasons why intelligent spirits may come across as non-intelligent, thus creating insuperable problems for distinguishing between the two. Many investigators consciously unconsciously consciously assume that most paranormal activity is residual unless proven otherwise, and that can and does color one's perception of the data or perceived phenomena and cause them to make a hasty or inaccurate conclusion. I saw this on TV. One well-known demonologist based their claim for residuality merely on the presence of an orb. To him, an orb was automatically assumed to be evidence of residual energy. But many other investigators see orbs as at least one form of intelligent spirit, intelligence that spirits can take. You know, which is it? Why can't an orb be seen as one form in which a demon can take? But the point is lack of uniformity of tests for residuality. This is clearly a problem for the paranormal community because one man's intelligence is another man's non-intelligence. Might the investigators come to a different conclusion if they called in a godly Christian demonologist who confronted all this alleged energy? I'm sure it would. I've seen it happen. Five. This is very common and done in different ways. The appeal to experience. I've been doing this for 40 years or 30 years, and I've developed this sense. I can just tell the nature of the energy, whether it's intelligent or non-intelligent. I can just distinguish the two, the difference. But you see, sadly, this is one field where longevity does not equal wisdom. The longer you are disobeying God by communicating with demons, then the more your brain will be maggot-ridden, and your ability to distinguish between good and evil will actually diminish with time. Your reasoning ability will be adversely affected as well. It's naive to pit your innate abilities against the evil one. You cannot call, and by the way, you can't call this you know, way of um, discerning, you can't call it the, Holy, it the Holy Spirit's gift of discernment either, not in the biblical sense. For many, they come to the conclusion based on a sixth sense of discernment by their resident psychic or medium, which is condemned by God. To them, it feels or appeal, appears non-intelligent to them or perhaps the spirit guide tells them so. But this is all subjective, and Satan can cause an environment to feel peaceful and even holy. 
or an energy to feel non-intelligent. If he can appear as an angel of light, his opposite, you know, the prince of darkness appearing as an angel of light, then appearing or feeling as a non-interactive spirit or energy would be a snap. Both are deceptions. But that is how many folks make their assessment of residual energy, by its feel. Or perhaps a medium tells them so, but the Bible condemns the activity of mediums in Deuteronomy 18, Leviticus 19 and 20, and throughout the major prophets. Condemns it in the strongest terms by calling this activity an abomination in his holy eyes. And they are unwittingly energized by demons themselves, causing them to see and sense when de what demons want them to see and sense. Demons are the masters of the psychic airwaves, not psychics or mediums. God utterly abhors psychic and mediumistic activity, and it elicits his jealous, furious rage as he sees this as spiritual adultery. If you're a Christian, you have no business employing either psychics or mediums, and it will expose all to demonic oppression. Many investigators naively assume that the presence of the demonic will always be associated with sulfur smells, satanic rituals, or violent reactions to holy objects, but that's Hollywood. The truth is that demons often appear and feel happy and ho or holy or non-intelligent. See, Kate Satan is a keen observer of human beliefs and behavior. The supreme opportunist, he will adapt his strategy to suit his desires and investigators' assumptions and expectations. If this is true, then don't you think that demons are intelligent enough to act non-intelligently in order to deceive us as their, to their true identity. Deception is our specialty, after all. I'm convinced that demons know how wed investigators are to this concept, and this is a perfect ploy to dissuade any attempts to banish them. Why send out the cavalry to cleanse the home when it is merely an interactive museum of non-intelligent energy from long ago? If I was Satan, no comment, I certainly would jump all over this notion like white on rice and use it to extend the kingdom of darkness. Demons will act dumb all day if that will allow them to not be banished and extend their reach of darkness. How many times at a reveal has a team leader told a homeowner that they have nothing to worry about because it is just energy looping and meanwhile Satan is laughing and also meanwhile this energy is causing heaviness sickness relational distress and even attacking people and worst of all turning people's affections away from Jesus folks have this mistaken notion that demonic halts are always over always overtly hostile, but in reality, many of their worst infestations are seemingly happy in nature. I call them happy haunts. Demons are unclean spirits, or fallen angels, they're all biblically synonymous, are happy to, quote, sit in the corner and act like spiritual radioactivity, eating away at the family's entire well-being, especially spiritually. They are the supreme opportunistic hunters, adapting their strategies to catch prey based on what they know to be our assumptions regarding residual energy. As a supreme opportunistic hunter of souls, the devil goes with the flow of developments in the paranormal, parapsychological fields, particularly since they're doing things which are uh, abominable to God. You see, if a group is investigating a house situated near a Civil War battlefield, then Satan knows that having his demons appear as re repetitive Civil War soldiers will seemingly validate the investigator's claims for why this is residual haunting is occurring, and reinforcing two of his most successful deceptions, intelligent human haunts and residual haunts. The demons were there when the battle occurred, and know how to mimic specific people 
whom the home homeowners may have photos of. You know, it, also, they have actually even changed our language. Instead of calling evil evil, we call it negative energy. In numerous cases of I, I've had, the folks were certain, at least at the beginning, that it was residual in nature, but in every case, it turned out to be demonic when confronted in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is amazing how many alleged non-intelligent haunts suddenly become very intelligent and very evil when confronted in the name of Jesus. It grieves me how many dear people have been given a severely deformed, inaccurate diagnosis of the problem, and thus the remedy was also deformed and misguided. It is also instructive how many investigators developed a very intelligent demonic attachment from a place that was supposed to be only residual energy. That should not happen if it's only energy, but it happens often. Very often. And this points, of course, to the demonic. In closing, Occam's Razor states that the simplest explanation that explains the phenomena is the most likely the correct one. Simple symmetry to it. To state that all true paranormal phenomena, as well as all alleged residual energy haunts, are demonic in nature is the simplest explanation and easily and comprehensively explains all the phenomena. And it does so without violating any of God's absolute scientific laws or relying on man's subjectivity or postulating abstruse theories. And it fits the biblical view of reality of fallen angels who are super intelligent and pure evil master deceivers. It only seems laughably simplistic sounding if you are already oppressed by evil. But in 2 Corinthians 10, we see that demonic strongholds are not just action-oriented, you know, folks being scratched, but the realm of ideas and beliefs are vital target areas. And the notion of residual energy haunt is a demonic stronghold which needs to be pulled down. Thank you.